Welcome to Ahkam SOS, the show that discusses duties and practices by His Eminence, the Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi Hafizullah. Inshallah, this season we'll also be looking at different other maraja and their verdicts on these topics as well. And I'm your host, Mohsin Shah, and joining me is Sheikh Ali Ma'ash. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Rahmatullah. How are you? Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Sheikh, now let's go straight in. And the question I want to ask is we know that a Muslim man, it is haram for him to wear gold. But what about jewellery which is gold-plated or watches which are gold-plated? Is that okay for him to wear or is that also considered haram? A'udhu billah as-sami'an alim in ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala al-tayibin al-tahirin Allahumma sallallahu ala muhammadin The Samahat Sayyid Sifatwa with this regard mentions that as an obligatory precaution Ihtiyat wujubi um, it should be avoided with such uh, gold-plated, let's say metallic, uh, whatever is, is the type of uh, items and particles, it is uh, better to avoid it with ihtiyat wujubi precaution. And this means if somebody is following Samahat Sayyid, he can refer back to another marja who says that yes, you can uh, wear, wear them. Because the, the, the Sayyid is making ihtiyat here, which is precaution, ihtiyat uh, wujubi. So the one can refer back to the marja who, who allows it. What about, Shaykhna, if I have uh, glasses and I wear, you know, I wear spectacles and I have a gold frame, is that acceptable? No, that's not acceptable to wear gold uh, in any means. So the gold is not allowed. Okay, so gold is not allowed, plated, even if it's for like, you know, what they call medical purposes, like glasses, not allowed. What about platinum? Uh, is platinum allowed for, for males to wear? Platinum is a type of metal. It's not gold. Um, in this situation, yes, it is allowed uh, to be used. It's permissible. Is white gold have the same... Does white gold have the same... Um, verdict, the same prohibition as normal gold? You have to ask the experts to see what do they mean by the white gold. Is it the platinum, for example, uh, they call it white gold, for example. Type of metal, they change it to, let's say, white, and they call it white gold. Or is it actual gold itself? And they in, in somehow changed the color and made it to look like white. If the second case is, is uh, what is meant to be, which is originally was a gold, then they made it white. Then it's haram. And you cannot use it as male, of course. Shaykhna, when it comes to gold and, and, and platinum, I mean, this is, you know, to like for, for males to, you know, in a way, beautify themselves and show off their wealth. Another way a, a man beautifies himself is with tattoos. Now, according to uh, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid uh, Sistani, uh, what is his opinion on tattoos? He would mention that, um, as he mentioned in uh, the fatawa, that yajus fi nafsi. In principle, it is allowed. Um, however, Samahat Sayyid Nimarjah would say that it is makruh to apply a tattoo and use tattoo on your body. It's makruh, uh, undesirable. In overall, it's not haram, uh, but the ones should think twice before, especially the ones which are permanent, unremovable. That, let's say if you're a youth or a young man and you want to get married, it's important that you think twice because you might have, uh, you know, the next uh, forthcoming uh, wife or the spouse. If she didn't like it, then you might be in trouble, for example. So things might happen in the future when you grow up and 
you don't know what to do with this tattoo because it's a permanent. So we have to think about it twice before we actually uh, apply the tattoo on our body. Sheikhna, unfortunately, our community, no different from other communities, we suffer from rumors and, you know, you know rumors spread around the community. Sometimes it's about an individual, sometimes it's about family, sometimes it's about um, a scholar, and even, even a marja. Sometimes it's even about a marja. As Muslims, what is our responsibility in regards to rumors in general, people talking bad about other people? The Holy Quran states, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna as-sam'a wal-basara wal-fu'ada, kullu ula'ika kan anhu mas'ula. Surely the hearing, the sight, and the heart, all of those shall be questioned about that. We have to be careful not to spread something uh, that causes, let's say, defame, destroys the one's reputation. Um, Imam Amir al Muminah he mentions with this regard, he says, not everything that is known may be said. You can't just say whatever comes on your mouth and tongue, just say it. In some narrations, it encourages for keeping silence. Just keep quiet. Don't talk. That's the best thing. Unless if it's something useful for dunya and akhirah, then talk. Otherwise, just keep silent. Keep quiet. Most of the punishments, or many of them, are from the, uh, the, the statements of the tongue and, and mouth. Imagine one leader can issue a statement and millions might be killed after a few days or weeks. Wow. So it's a severe and destructive means for the one who uses Naudu Billah, his uh, tongue, in the wrong way. So it's better to avoid it and to keep silence unless we need to speak and, and to talk. I think, you know, the, the tongue is arguably the most, you know, sharpest tool. And um, I remember my friend used to say, you know, there's 32 guards two gates and it still escapes and I think you know uh, the, one of the biggest you know battles of the nafs is actually to control your tongue speaking of which it leads me to my next question of you know slandering and swearing is it okay to you know use such language when joking with, with friends and stuff to, to slander and to swear again if it consists to be defaming and destructing uh, others reputations and personalities, and it's haram, of course. Otherwise, it is not praised, it is uh, undesirable and discouraged for the one to use such foul language against his friends, especially their mu'mineen. I mean, um, you're not talking to somebody who is uh, outside the iman uh, um, area. So the best thing is to avoid it. Try to learn uh, ourselves and teach ourselves uh, to say wise words, beneficial words, beautiful words, to attract even the non-Muslims to Islam. When they see us, we talk in this way and in this pattern. MashaAllah, inshallah. You know, inshallah, we could all be a good example to the whole of society, inshallah. Sheikh Ma, in regards to, um, you know, doing good deeds, how can one control like his niya and his intention? How can one um, be on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, perform his Islamic duties and his Islamic acts for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for the sake of his own reputation to look good in the Muslim community, to, to, you know, to, to gain more favours or to gain more praises within his community and his friends but rather than actually obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We have in some narrations that uh, one of the types of the ibadah of Abu Dhar rahmahullah was to, to reflect and ponder in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the matters of Allah. If the individual wants to reach that level in which whatever he does would be for the cause and the intention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the one should reflect always, have this reflection towards the creation of Allah reflection 
and think about that the fate and the future of, of myself and the rest of the humanity is the hereafter. It's life after death. So when we have this image of the hereafter, of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we have to stand before him on the day of judgment, the one will automatically move towards uh, offering the good intention in all aspects of life. When he is, let's say, helping others, when he is offering a service to the community, when he is, let's say, lecturing or giving a speech or uh, um, even by himself reading the dua and so forth, the Quran, the citations. When you have that image in front of you, the, the life after death, and Allah's Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, uh, hisab on the day of judgment, then the one can easily uh, uh, correct his intention and use the right path towards uh, acting according to Allah's uh, pleasure and satisfaction. Excellent. Sheikh, I've got a question here from, from someone and it says, I used to be adherent to the right path and I used to perform the five daily prayers until I came to the USA and I was misled by the shaitan. I began to neglect I began to be neglectful of my daily prayers and I could feel that I could not continue on this path and I had an inner remorse since that day. I, uh, inner remorse since the day I stopped the salah. In other words, I have stopped the salah but I have not forgotten it and in my heart I am tormented by pain and I know it is the conscience and remorse. It has been six months and I want to start again but will Allah Almighty accept my repentance after what I have done to myself? So we have an individual here who, due to uh, migrating to uh, another place, um, has become very neglectful, weak, we could say, in his salah, uh, has missed out on six months worth of salah. Um, will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive this man? And what should this individual do as well as, as you know, to, to uh, compensate for his deeds? Initially, this individual should always keep in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful, as I've mentioned in the previous episodes, that the door of mercy is always, and the repentance is always open. Whenever the, the individual wanted to go, to go back to the good deeds and apply them and repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the doors are open always, and avoid the losing hope towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because one of the greatest sins are to lose hope. Mm -hmm and to despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the greatest sins. So the doors are open, there are opportunities, and he's still, this individual is young. Um, the main thing he should do, for example, he should repeat his salah as qada, whatever he did missed of the, of the prayers and fasting, and you know, start from scratch, from fresh, a new page of life, and the main thing is to avoid the shaitan because every individual, every human being has three enemies. It's the shaitan, the Satan, and the nafs al-ammara, the evil self, and the corrupt society or the bad friends. If the one can control these three main powers and desires and uh, uh, enemies and evils, then the one can easily uh, gain that calmness and faithness and Iman in which he will feel and taste the, the sweetness in his heart. So the best thing is to go back to Allah SWT, avoid these um, evil uh, means in his life, then he will inshallah succeed by the will of Allah SWT. In regards to missed prayers, uh, I think we, it's, it's fair to say that sometimes Fajr is the most difficult prayer to wake up for and a lot of brothers and sisters miss that prayer. Um, one excuse, or not an excuse, one, one reason for this is that people go to sleep late. Now, in the opinion of Ayatollah Sheikh uh, Wahid Khurasani, is it okay for someone to stay awake until Fajr and to pray the Fajr prayer and then go to sleep? Or should one actually go to sleep and then wake up for the Fajr prayer? 
Ayatollah Khurasani would mention that um, if the one who stays awake would lead to missing the Fajr prey, then he is sinful. If this act of staying overnight, you know, awake all night, and he knows that if he stays awake till, let's say, half past two, and he knows if he sleeps, he can't wake up, because 3.30 in the next one hour time is Salat al-Fajr. How could he wake up again? So he knows that he will miss, or she knows that she will miss the Salah of Fajr, then he becomes athim, as the say, mm -hmm. Samahat al-Sheikh says, which means uh, sinful. So the say is clear about the fact that if somebody uh, remained uh, awake till the midnight and that caused for the individual to miss a salah, then he committed the sin, haram. And the state also mentions uh, other um, facts that in staying awake all night or part of the night has consequences on the body of the individual and to the uh, self, the human self and the body. So mentally, bodily would also harm that individual who stays awake uh, till midnight or most of the night. So it's better to avoid it, to uh, basically avoid the missing of the bounties that you might get by sleeping early, that you wake up early, you do Salat al-Layl before the Salat al-Fajr, yes. you do the Nafila and then Fajr, and then you stay awake till the sunrise, and then you sleep after sunrise. Great bounties and great thawab you would gain from such act. So it's better for the dunya and the akhirah, for your uh, you know, well-being, for the health-wise, to sleep early, as recommended by the medics, and to also gain the akhirah by waking up early, at least to pray the Salat al-Fajr on time, and still um, I mean, uh, be awake till the sunrise, and you gain the thawab in both cases. And of course, if you make the intention that I sleep early in order to wake up for Salat al-Fajr on time and do the dua and Quran and so forth, you would get even the rewards for sleeping uh, early. Ahsan, um, it's, it's, it's amazing how Islam has given us all the answers. Um, I mean, I was, I was looking at the habits of some of the most successful people in the world and they wake up at four or five in the morning. You know, the, the most successful people in the world wake up uh, you know, at dawn or you know, just just before the sun rises, they, they wake up an hour, two hours before sunrise, you know, to start their day. And Islam already is telling us to wake up, to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, begin your day with ibadah and then go out and, and, and go do what we need to do, earn your bread or you know, go back to sleep if you're tired. Thank you very much, Sheikh Lan. Thank you to all our viewers for joining us on this episode of Ahkam SOS. If you have a question that you'd like to send in, uh, you could do it on ahkam, SOS at imamhussein.tv. The email should be there at the bottom. Uh, if not, you can join us on the next episode of Ahkam SOS. And we'll be discussing more on uh, youth and also moral and ethical issues uh, from, the, uh, from the opinion of Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi, Hafizullah, and also other maraja, inshallah. Until next episode, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. <laughs>